will just be my introduction. My name is Aoife O'Connor and I've been with Find My Pass for eight years now. Um, my interests are, if anybody joined us on our crime webinar, are in juvenile crime, so a crossover between crime and children in the 19th century. And I edited a book of photographs called Small Lives, Photographs of Irish Childhood, 1860 to 1970, about 10 years ago, long out of print. So today I want to talk to everybody about our ancestors' childhood, and as it says, at work, at play, at mischief and at war. So, shall we get going? And please, during in the comments, share your stories. Lovely. So here's a picture of my siblings in 1979-1980. And so I suppose one of the main things that I'll be repeating throughout the talk is that everybody's childhood is of course different. My experience of childhood is very different to that of my nieces and nephews. Your children's childhood would be different to yours and your parents' childhood was different to your own. When I grew up in the 1970s in Dublin, it was perfectly normal to be wearing handmade clothes from my mother. It was perfectly normal to be bathing only once a week. And commercial toys such as the Manchichi and the dolls that you see here were somewhat unusual. And indeed, my mother made many of our toys, as you can see at the dog at the end. We grew up in a house with open fires and no heating. Now, I will say that was unusual for the 70s and 80s, but we were also unusual for being the family on the street that had a telephone. And people would come and telephone their children who had moved to Australia from our house. And I believe that my parents were one of the first houses on the road to also own a television. So it's in that sort of vein that I want to cover off this talk today. I will, of course, talk about the records that are available on Find My Past, and I will delve, as always, into newspapers to tell this story. But the main context is this idea that childhood is a diverse experience. And so what is a child? I have just a series of words here, and throughout history, the definition of who was a child changed, of course. So you have infants and babies, and indeed in the census, you'll often see an occupation of infant or baby against a child who's under about two or three years of age. You have this idea that certain things are attained as you grow older, and that wasn't always the case throughout history. So are you no longer a child at 16 when you can join the army? Are you no longer a ch child at 18 when you can vote? Are you no longer a child at 12 at one point when you could marry if you were a girl or 14 if you were a boy? Were you a child or not a child when at the age of seven you could be imprisoned for committing a crime and were considered to be uh, responsible for your actions? So these are all the sorts of things we're going to think about today. Did they have the concept of a teenager in the 19th century? So were children little adults or mother's pets? So as I say, parenting styles are not unique, are unique to a family, not to a time period. You will have stricter families, you will have more relaxed families. And while of course there are prevailing norms, there are things that everybody sort of buys into, much like no man leaving the house without a hat right through to the 1950s. There are certain things that you would consider perfectly normal that change over time, or things that you would never consider doing and which also change over time. And of course, as we return to time and time again, a family's socioeconomic circumstances will affect their parenting style. Children from poorer families are probably not going to have a great amount of sort of birthday celebration or Christmas. And likewise, they're going to be, uh, you know, working and that sort of thing. And so everything is quite local. Until after the Second World War, you don't really get a national sort of consistent story around children, notwithstanding some of the things we will talk about when education begins to be introduced uh, formally in the 1870s. And a lot of things rely on local charities. So what we want to talk about today is this idea of childhood while always keeping in mind that it is uh, unique to a family oftentimes. Indeed, your own siblings will have a different experience of their childhood than you did. 
and this idea that things take time to filter through. So a law might be made, but it could be years before it is you know, taken up and really firmly in, in hold uh, across the country. And we'll talk about that as we go. So let's have a quick look at a tiny timeline. This is a vast, vast topic, but let's just place some things for ourselves. So in 1833, textile factories are no longer permitted to employ children under the age of nine. In 1847, children's working hours are limited to 10 hours a day. Limited to 10 hours a day. We'll come back to that. In 1881, schooling is compulsory for children up to the age of 10. However, we don't get free education until 1891. In 1889, you have the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. It was, however, preceded by local chapters. Again, it's that local to national story in Liverpool. Have I spelled, spelled Liverpool wrong? No, it feels like I have. And London Society. So that's 1889. In 1929, the marriage age is raised from 12 for girls and 14 for boys to 16 for both. And teenagers make their first appearance in the 1930s, although adolescence had been understood as an in-between time, an in-between state between childhood and adulthood since the early 1800s. So it's with that context that we'll pop forward. So of course, children are found in all records. And as we always say, records are about when your life intersects with some sort of officialdom, be that the church or be that the state, through schools, prison, the military and all of these things. So of course they're in all records. Births and baptisms, marriage of course. I don't really have examples of marriage today. I was trying to hunt down some child marriages that I had found in our British and India collection but they eluded me in my search when I was trying to fill them in for here. And of course children pass away. We have them in census records as I say at with occupations, which I love. I love those people for putting those in as baby or infant a lot of the time, or indeed as scholar, which just means they're attending school. They, of course, emigrate with their family. Indeed, although we don't have much representation of that on Find My Past, they emigrate alone. They are sent to Canada, sent to Australia as orphans. One point actually on orphanhood, since I mentioned it, mentioned it is that you both parents didn't necessarily have to be deceased for you to be classified as an orphan. You could be classified as an orphan if one of your parents was deceased. Usually I want to say the father because that meant that there was no economic stability, particularly in the family home. Children enter the military. They appear in prison and court and of course they appear in newspapers. Some records specific to children are of course vaccinations, school records and apprenticeships. So let's look at the Glasgow smallpox vaccination records that we have on Find My Past. And so here you'll see there's a list of children who have been vaccinated. Their ages are given three months, five months, four months, 14 months. Vaccination had started in the last quarter of the 18th century and it cost money to have your child vaccinated. You can see down the bottom two pounds and 13 shillings for these oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or so children to be vaccinated. And as you can see, it does give an address of the child as well. So vaccination is very much part of the culture, particularly in Scotland by the late 18th century. And that grows and grows um, throughout the years and becomes more normalized. So vaccination for the smallpox vaccine originally was they would cut your skin with a scalpel and introduce the smallpox into your bloodstream by placing it under the skin. And then we get a nasal where they put drops in your nose to introduce the uh, smallpox virus and then we then we eventually get uh, syringes so um, if you can imagine a scalpel being taken to sort of your arm or something for for the piece of um, smallpox flesh uh, taken from an animal that had smallpox inserted under your arm uh, there so it was it was quite a thing it was quite a risk for people as well this idea of giving yourself the disease in order to get immunity to the disease and so some very brave parents here uh, in the very early 1800s, getting their children vaccinated. 
So health and well-being obviously has been something that has concerned people for a long time uh, about children. And I think what we want to get away from this is the idea that because ch child mortality was high, um, that there was a disregard for children. Mortality was something that you accepted as p more usual in life, but you certainly did not, not grieve a child who passed away, as we will get on to now in a moment. But of course, this meant that um, people were having all sorts of things put forward to them, quack cures and that sort of thing. And so here we have mothers, mothers, mothers. And I think a lot of what we're going to see about childhood is about, you know, how can we advertise and create commodities for children as well? So this is the best medicine in the world for infants and young children. Uh, it is under the patronage of the Queen, uh, the high and universal celebrity of which medicine continues to maintain for the prevention and cure of the disorders incident to infants. Um, affect affections of the bowels, difficult teething, the thrush, rickets, measles, whooping cough, cowpox, or vaccine inoculation. Because as you can appreciate, some people do get quite queasy when they get vaccinated. So what they're suggesting here that their medicine will help with that. But notice as well the infections that are being called out. Rickets, something that we have thankfully uh, mostly done away with. And interestingly, thrush. So they're not shying away from, you know, calling out the diseases that could be associated with, uh, you know, lack of hygiene or venereal diseases indeed that could be passed on to children. And indeed, children can get... Um, venereal diseases from their, their from their mothers when they are born. And then the one on the right, I, I think is just is, is slightly amusing, is that no man can minister to an infant with a woman's tenderness. Why should woman's want of knowledge, I beg your pardon, deprive her of the happiness of preserving infant life? And that, of course, has to do with the fact that for a long time, women were excluded from being medical doctors. But there was some understanding that uh, there was an empathy and a sympathy there that was needed for uh, child patients and they couldn't simply treat the disease but that you had to treat the whole child and i just thought this was a nice juxtaposition of an ad from 1892 and an ad from 1962 of uh, children's food and uh, this idea that uh, you would move away from from breastfeeding and that you would go on to these foods quite early in the child's life. Um, the melons food for infants and invalids, in fact, in some of its advertisements um, has testimonies from mothers that say they have switched their children to melons food for infants at the age of six weeks. And they always have these pictures that you can't, they're a little bit smaller here, but in some of the pictures they have these pudgy little babies and they're declaring how many pounds in weight they have gained from the food that they have been fed. So the other thing, of course, to draw your attention to throughout of this is how early some things are. So here we have uh, an artificial food for children in 1892. And we'll see that in other themes as well as we go through. Here we have a hospital. This is a very well appointed hospital, plenty of toys for the children and the infants, of course, all lined up in uh, iron cast beds there and uh, this comes from our photo collection and this is from uh, Trinity Mirror or Reach PLC as it is known so some wonderful photography there from the 1920s the tiny child on the rocking horse I'm not sure that was the brightest idea we could have popped him into the chair instead of the teddy I think and things like walkers, uh, so a child walker that perhaps you're familiar with. I mean, they've been around since the medieval period and certainly since the 17th century. So it's this, this idea that, you know, things that we think are super modern uh, have actually got a very long pedigree. This is a family who are trying to cure earache in 1934. Sorry, that's gone off the screen slightly. Curing earache. And the idea, of course, is that you pour warm water into the ear and that it's going to dislodge the infection. So some of these sort of home cures still being practiced right into the 1930s. And I think if we're all honest, practiced uh, right up until today. So I want to just talk about child mortality a little bit more. And here we have some instances of, of children who in fact had passed away being recorded by their family in the 1911 census. So we've Walter Harry Sillett's son deceased uh, deceased being put in by the family into the occupation column. Edward Thomas 
son, aged five. So he's been recorded at the age, you know, when he passed away. The crossing out that you see is the enumerator. And, uh, we, you know, there are some very poignant things to be thought that these, these parents are filling in these children. So we've Alfred next, he's two, again, occupation. In the occupation column, the only place that they could record it, uh, and he was two when he passed away. And if I recall correctly, Alfred Bradley was that couple's only child. They were only in their very, they were only in their twenties themselves. Uh, and he is the only child they've had and they're recording him from posterity. Grace, daughter, 11 months, again, crossed out by the enumerator and uh, Arthur as well, son, seven months, again, crossed out by the enumerator. So at Find My Past, we of course always record people who are crossed out because it gives you the opportunity to find them. So people weren't cavalier about the fact that their children were passing away. And uh, this census gave them an opportunity, as I say, to record them somewhere official and to let, them know, let the world know that they had existed. So childcare in the late 19th century and early 1900s, of course, again, as I say, is going to be local. It's going to be charity based. Uh, employers offer a certain amount of childcare, others don't. This is a charity childcare for working mothers. And that's, of course, the other thing. It's, it's not a case of a modern phenomenon that mothers work uh, in you know, poorer backgrounds, the women had to work. They had to go out to work every day. They had to work long days, 12 hour days. And the children would hopefully be either cared for by older siblings, or indeed in this case, as I say, a care home was provided. But that was very much, as I said, a local situation and would require say a local church or a local society to actually provide that for the children. And this is from the Mother's Companion, which of course is on Find My Past. Anything I'm showing you here today, it's not just images I've gotten from the internet. They are, they are all available on Find My Past, so you can locate these yourself uh, if you have an interest in the history of childhood. And I have some book recommendations at the end. And also, of course, if you're looking to broaden your understanding of what childhood was like for your ancestor at the period that they were living in because it's going to change over time, it's going to change of locality, and it's going to change because of local circumstances. As we always say, history is local, not national when you're living it day to day. So of course, when ragged schools um, and that like get created, because of course, first of all, education is not compulsory. A lot of it is fee paying. And so it is up to charities to provide ragged schools for children who, you know, are not yet out to work, uh, depending on the time period we're at, of course, um, and provide that schooling. And as you can see from this drawing here, this is uh, predominantly, if not entirely, and in fact, probably is all boys benefiting from the education. So education in school. And if you just see the notation there, attendance thin on account of the fair. So attendance at school, as I say, was quite uh, intermittent for a lot of children. Our summer holidays, as they are now, were of course harvest holidays. They were intended to allow children, particularly in rural areas, of course, to assist with the harvest. And so that is that sort of dictated the timing of the holidays. Just thought this was interesting again from our photo collection homeschooling in October 1939 schools being bombed schools being closed down uh, this is actually a teacher who took it upon herself to set up school in her own home and invite some of her previous pupils to her home but you also see it um, with evacuees and you also see it with just you know the sort of person on the street who takes it upon themselves to ensure that the children continue to have an education. So on Find My Past, we have a series of school books and uh, generally speaking, they're split into admission books and school logs. And the admission books, of course, have the name, luckily for us, often the precise date of birth. And if they don't have the precise date of birth of the child, they will have the child's age in years and months. Fair parents or uh, only father's occupation. It really depends on the log, whereas they include both parents or uh, just the father's name. Uh, the father's occupation, or sometimes it seems to be called quality, what the father's quality is. Uh, the residence, uh, the education level and the date of admission and withdrawal. And in some school registers, you will, of course, see the fees that were paid to attend school. They could be waived for certain students, but they also um, 
could actually just be uh, low fees or of course quite high fees. And then we have logs which are general log of attendance and activities at the school. So let's have a look at a couple of examples here. So as you can see, uh, each child has a number, a register number, as we all did when we went to school, their date of admission, uh, this is 1875, the month is October and the, the day is day five. And of course, children are going to school at uh, age three and four at this stage. I believe, um, I think in Ireland it's been raised to five and in some places it's been raised to six before children attend primary school. For obviously there's preschools, but uh, the age seems to have gotten older as the years have gone by. And uh, the address tends to just either be the parish or, you know, just it, it, not always a full street address. And we have the occupations of the fathers, labourer, carpenter, cook, labourer, uh, shoemaker. And then we have uh, the children's exact date of birth. And notice how these are pre-printed. So it's 1875. Compulsory schooling hasn't been there that long, but also we have we already have pre-printed registers, you know, to enter these details to make sure they are consistent across the country. Some of them are handwritten and you will find that, of course, and earlier registers are, you know, a little less precise on the details. And then we have the standard of education that the child has reached while at the school. And then the date of their leaving. You do get annotations in some of the books about why they've left. Either they've gone to another school. I saw one where they had emigrated to America. Some simply hadn't returned to the school. Um, and uh, so th their attendance had been so intermittent that they are struck from the register. And so this is one of the log books and uh, teachers seem to, it's supposed to be filled in by essentially the head teacher, the most senior teacher, and the level of detail can vary and you can keep, kind of see it slip away towards perhaps, you know, the end of the year and I just popped that in at the bottom right and it's just essentially nothing to record, nothing to record, nothing to record, nothing to record. I think they're getting a little bored about having to do it every single day. So the top entry uh, on the left hand side now is the usual quarterly examination was concluded, a list of proficiency drawn up and reports made out and forwarded to the parents. And then the Reverend uh, Sir Glynn arrives to give his usual scriptural lesson and the schools take other examinations. And then we've another nothing worthy to comment from the 11th to the 13th. We got very lazy there. We didn't even bother filling it in every day. And um, so there we see August the 7th, the harvest vacation commenced for weeks. September the 7th, the school reopened after harvest vacation with a fair attendance of scholars. So there's, there is all of this um, recording of just how good the attendance is, because remember school is not compulsory at this point. And so we see thin attendance, as I said, due to a country fair taking place or even the races, the horse races can affect school attendance. Um, a wedding, a local wedding, they seem to attend the weddings of the teachers. Again, these are probably quite small schools. You're probably speaking anywhere between, you know, 15 pupils to 30 to 40 pupils in a school rather than the hundreds or even thousands that we see today. So this is a list of some of our school records. And the one I've been referring to has been the National School Admission Registers and Logbooks. As you can see, we have 9 million entries in those, and they run from 1870 to 1914. We also have a browse version of that if you uh, simply want to do uh, some general research in those. The other thing, of course, that you will note, and I think we're all familiar from from World War One, is that some of our school records are, in fact, lists of those who passed away during the First World War and are being commemorated by their school because they were probably only just left school or of school-ish age when they departed for the front. I just thought this was a nice picture. Sebastian School, 1916. All the little girls. Um, Looking a little dishevelled and uninterested and some boys in the mix there as well. So from school we move to work. In the 18th century and before, uh, it's a sort of work from home, a shared labour situation, it's a family affair. 
So the entire family is involved in the family business. You're helping out at home. There's no schooling, remember, except for perhaps some Sunday schooling, a bit of education here and there. Reading and writing is not necessary for most um, jobs. And so a family, let's say a family on a small subsistence farm that are also perhaps uh, adding to their income by doing a bit of spinning or weaving. So you can see in that scenario how the whole family are simply working together and it's perfectly normal and it is how the economy works. It's when we move into things like factory work that we begin to hear all the stories that we're probably all familiar with and in between and overlapping and indeed to the modern day we have apprenticeships. And then here are some of the annotations that were in some of the school records. Gone to work in factory gone to work at Brickyard, died 1873. He actually died the same year he went to the Brickyard and I do wonder if he died in a Brickyard accident, but I did not go into that. And so there's lots of these annotations about how a child has gone on to work from the school records. Boy for sale. So I'm taking that from, of course, the Oliver Twist movie. And this idea that uh, children were sent out to these apprenticeships. Apprenticeships could, of course, be very coveted. Uh, you would pay for a skilled master to take on your child and hope that your child uh, displayed the same amount of skill in something like gold work or, or anything else. And you would pay a premium and uh, the master would take in your child for a period of, it depended on how old they were when they entered into the apprenticeship, usually about seven years, although you will see an annotation there for 21 and I'll get to that in a moment. And they would train with the master and they would receive food and board and in return they would learn a trade. And then once of course they had reached a particular proficiency, they would move on from their master, hopefully become a journeyman or indeed a master of their own. So it was uh, an excellent way for a person to learn a trade, but it did cost money in most cases. We also had parish apprentices and parish apprentices were a way of uh, destitute children being moved to essentially a master. Now the master could actually, I think, be the parish and they would simply train and be labor for, for the parish. And those apprenticeships were 21 years, but the children were often a lot younger when they went into those apprenticeships. So as you can expect, you'd get the name of the apprentice, uh, parents and the master. The residents, often of both the parents and the master, but sometimes only one. The date of the indenture, the age of the apprentice when they entered into this agreement, a fee, if any, the trade that they were going to train under and the duration of the apprenticeship, the intended. Obviously, there's a mix of details on some and others. So the parish apprentices, as you can imagine, being sent away quite young, had a tendency to run away. And that's what this newspaper report is. And apologies, I don't have the newspaper on that one. So a uh, runaway apprentice, whereas th Andrew Freeman, who falsely calls himself Thomas Andrew Freeman, and si age 16, a parish apprentice to Mr. Thomas Wilson Farmer of North uh, Luffenham in the county of Rutland eloped from his said master on Sunday night or early on Monday morning last. The said apprentice is about five feet two inches in height uh, of a fresh complexion, light brown hair, has lost some of his teeth by the kick of a horse. Dear me. Um, and he had, when he went away, a brown coat, uh, a velvet waistcoat and leather breeches and took with him another brown coat. So he is essentially potentially stolen from his master, which is an extremely serious uh, crime, uh, a striped waistcoat with a blue back and also uh, a corduroy waistcoat with sleeves, a pair of leather breeches and four shirts. Oh dear, yes, he has stolen quite a bit. Therefore, whoever harbours or employs the said apprentice after this notice will be prosecuted as the law directs. So this is 1802, so uh, he could be transported for this level of theft. And uh, or depending on how the situation rolls out, he would be brought back to his apprentice because we do see other notices that uh, and oddly one that an apprentice had uh, the apprentice had placed it in the newspaper where they are saying that I have unlawfully run away from my master several times and I'm very sorry because he was very good to me. Uh, so you find that they're being brought back to their masters a, a great deal as well and continuing to run away. 
So the treatment of apprentices obviously ran the full spectrum, as indeed any of the stories about children there. They run the full spectrum from very well treated, you know, becoming almost like a son to the family, right the way through to extremely abusive scenarios and uh, obviously running away as well. So this is uh, an indenture. And so as you can see, again, these are not informal arrangements. There are pre-printed documents and indeed they are set out as though for uh, girls or boys to become apprentices. Um, a poor child of said parish who becomes apprenticed to somebody and they will serve from the day of the date of these presents until the apprentice shall accomplish full age of 21 years. And in some situations they also say or is married. So they either become an apprentice for until they reach the age of 21 years or they get married. And so this is a list then of our apprenticeship records. And actually, if on our A to Z, you type in the word that you're looking for, like apprentice or school and hit return um, on your keyboard, it will just return the list of all of those records for you. And you can save that link. If you, if you click and save that link, it will save it as a list of all of our apprentice records. And I have been, I've been looking at the parish apprentices here. And then we've also been discussing things like the country apprentices as well. And then we have other records for other parts of the country. So if we talk more about work, we need to talk about factories. Um, Children's work, of course, as I said, was in home industries. It was on the farm when they were sent home for those summer holidays, in fact, to help with the harvest. But most infamously, they're associated with factories and particularly textile factories. So here we have an illustrated London News illustration, and this is a government inspector coming to inspect a factory. You can see quite young girls in the factory. You have the smoke in the background and you have the factory owner or supervisor looking a little bit worried there in the background. 40 years previously, 50 years previously, he had nothing to worry about. The conditions for children in factories were could be quite appalling. And this is a fiction piece that was written by a campaigner against child workers in factories in 1842. So this is before the age is uh, the 10 hour day comes in. It is five o'clock on a January morning. The child is up and with its scanty covering pulled about it descends shivering to the street. Poor little wench. So this is a child. The story goes that she has just reached nine years of age. And while previously she might have been, uh, you know, making do or even possibly begging on the street, she now has to go into the factory because she has reached that age of nine. And he has a whole piece on where the surgeon checks her mouth and her teeth to make sure that she is actually nine years old. And the whole point is, is that although she's nine, she's she's tiny, she's slight, she's, um, you know, not very well fed. And so this is narrative bills to try and gain the sympathy of the newspaper readers about how it is really quite cruel to send her out to work. And he ends, or at least the extract that is printed in the newspaper ends with, but things cannot be as they are. The time is approaching when the wrongs at this moment, uh, eating like ulcers into the social body will be cleansed. Uh, with the cruelty, will be classed, sorry, with the cruelty of bygone ages, another generation and they who insist on the necessity of the condition of the nine years old factory child of our day will take their places with the admirers of thumbscrews and the champions of the social values of the steel boot. And he's actually quite um, insightful here in that it, although a law passes in 1847 to make it that um, children can only, only work 10 hours a day, it does take many years and indeed decades for children to disappear from the factories entirely. So although you have these early, what we call early adopters, these people who see it for what it is, who want it changed, and then you have factories that do change, it is still many decades, as I said, before children disappear from the factories altogether. So in 1842, 
we have the Children's Employment Commission. So this is an official investigation into the treatment of children at factories. Uh, children are there, they're there for 12, 14 hours a day. So they are technically fed by the factory. It depends on the factory. If it's near a city centre, they're sent home um, and there's no food provided or they you know, have to make do and you know, bring some food and often eat on the job because it's just go, go, go all the time. So this is a particular factory that are saying, we think it very desirable that children should not be required to work under 10 or even 11 years of age in order to allow time for education previously. But taking into account the necessitous and in many cases destitute condition of the poor parent or parents and also the easy description of the work required in their particular factory, it's a tobacco factory, uh, we do not think that children above nine years of age should be prevented from working at tobacco spinning works. More than two thirds of the boys employed in our works have no father living and the loss of their small earnings would be severely felt by their mothers. The work required for tobacco spinner boys is a very light and easy description and in fact the being confined to the workshop during the working hours is the principal thing to be considered in connection to, with their work. The boys employed in our work have an opportunity of attending a night school. Can you imagine trying to work to go to night school after a 10 or 12 hour working day? As the work closes regularly every night at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock I beg your pardon, and on Saturdays at 2 o'clock. So they are working a minimum of six days a week. And I have seen other instances where factories were open on a Sunday. So children below nine years of age, although quite able to perform the work required, might be injured by the confinement. In other words, having to stay indoors all day doing the same thing, repetitive work. And on that account, as well as to allow some time for education in a day school, we think children below that age should not be employed. So this is um, either a very forward thinking factory for its time, or they're just saying what they think they should say. So they're saying that um, it would actually be a detriment if you didn't allow some of these children to work because their families are in such dire straits. But that they concede that maybe it's not the best idea. But six days a week with only Sunday off, sometimes not even Sunday off, uh, Saturdays, uh, half time is somewhat unusual um, and then eventually Saturdays become a non-working day and that's how you gain more leisure time and then uh, combine that with compulsory schooling later on that's how you get this idea of childhood being more about education and leisure rather than it being perfectly normal for children to work alongside their family and then when it translated into the factory and the conditions in the factory with the machinery that was involved of course was far more dangerous but the idea of children working in of itself was not problematic so here we have 1899 so now we have compulsory schooling and so people are beginning to comment in the newspaper has school children are working for wages and it appears that in 206 schools in the hampshire in hampshire uh, 2,722 full-time scholars who were employed for profit, uh, 2,200 boys and 522 girls. So this is, uh, so we now have compulsory schooling. So they're getting this idea, mm, these children are still working. They're either not attending school, they're only attending school part-time or they're trying to work after school. They're running errands for shopkeepers, they're on farms, they're farming, they're cattle minding, doing odd jobs, cleaning knives and boots um, or working as houseboys. 732 were under 10 hours and some were doing 10 to 20 hours in the week. And then it talks about their rates of pay, which of course would have been minimal. Now, 1899. Now we move on to 1914 and 1939. And the Textile Workers Association representing nearly 40,000 members decided at Southport on Tuesday to support an increase in the age of half-timers from 12 to 13 years. So this is 1914. And so you still have children at the age of 12 working half-time in the textile industry. And they're just agreeing to raise that up to 13. Now, I will say that in my lifetime, it was perfectly normal for my, my parents to both leave school at around the age of 13 and not continue with secondary education and then to go on into work. And yet it has gone from their parents 
never being education, educated and, and being illiterate. Uh, my grandparents were born in the 1890s. To my parents born in the 1930s and 40s receiving a primary school level education but being expected to then go out to work at about the age of 13 or 14. So in the 19, late 1940s in Ireland. And then for me, for the expectation to slowly come around that in fact I would have a university level education before potentially going out to work. So in three generations you've gone from potentially no schooling to very little schooling to uh, minimal primary schooling with no genuine expectation unless they received a scholarship to go on to secondary school because we are only talking about primary school education here being free. Secondary school education was still very much paid even after 1891 and then the expectation that I born in the 1970s would actually go on to uh, full education and not only full education but potentially university as well. And so then Manchester Evening News 1939 we still have child factory workers. Uh, 500,000 juvenile workers under the age of 16 in factory employment. Lovely. And since we were talking about the wartime period there I transition now to children at war. Children, uh, boys, could of course join the army as drummer boys or simply as boys. They weren't technically soldiers uh, and they didn't serve abroad I think until they were 19. Uh, modern day British army you can join at 16 and you can make your application when you are 15 and seven months old so that by the time it goes all the way through you'll be 16 and you can join up but you shouldn't, uh, you're not deployed internationally or beyond uh, the home country until you are 19. So the uh, band's boy William Garbutt there in 1916 is 15 years old and of course famously we all know that some very young men uh, falsified their age in order to join up in World War One, and indeed saw action on the front at, at the ages of 14 and 15 having lied about their age because as long as they reached the physical measurements uh, which I think was five foot three and a 32 inch chest then they could join the army and if you could you know fake that uh, then you could probably convince people that you were of an age and there isn't as much sort of focus on documentation at this time and so if they were away from home or, or nobody was paying them any heed uh, they could certainly manage to join up. So I just want to talk about this one from 18 the 1850s and this is John Hogan he was 14 years and seven months old his uh, occupation was as a tailor and in 1859 he joined the South Wales Borderers or 24th Foot. He goes through his career which uh, spanned 23 years and 255 days uh, going from boy to a private he was a private for a long time and a drummer and eventually at the very end a corporal. He was at home, he was in Mauritius, he was in India, he was back home again, he was at the Cape, he was at the Mediterranean, India again, and then home again for his the final piece of his service. So a hugely long career in the military from the age of 14 years old. And so that's the other thing, don't discount if everything else fits and of course in this instance his next of kin is his father because he is only 14 years old so it's not he's not listing a wife as his next of kin he's he's listing his father as his next of kin so don't discount the idea that they might be in the military despite the fact that they are quite young so if, if they served in world war one and you're not finding them in those records and as we know uh, a great percentage of those records were destroyed it could be that they were already signed up before the war. So look for them in the uh, British Army records that we have that predate World War One. I. I just wanted to have a quick look for John because something struck me that he is a young man to be joining the army. I know it's 1859 uh, or whatever it was so I checked him out in 1851 and if we just take note here's John he's six at this time of course it's a few years before but if you notice his father is a widower and not only that but there's a Charles Hogan there at the bottom who was only just born it's 1851 he's he's not even a year old 
And so my, my suspicion is, is that his mother died in childbirth with his uh, brother Charles. Uh, the father is left with all his children, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight children, all under the age of 14. And so I think it's quite likely then that that played into John's choice to join the army. It's good steady pay. It's excellent steady pay for a young man. And so he's probably joining as soon as it occurs to him or as soon as he's able. Uh, and then that way, you know, he has an independent life. And it could be that his father remarried. But either way, uh, I think this circumstance plays into this. And indeed, this type of circumstance can also play into children uh, entering into a life of crime as well. One thing I'll just mention as well, of course, is that war affected children through uh, the evacuations that happened. And in the 1939 register and find my past, uh, many of these children, of course, are still alive. So they, they are, could be well redacted in 1939. But there are children uh, who are very far away from home in the 1939 register. And that's the other thing, if you have any suspicion that they may have been evacuated from London or I think Hull and some of the other places that were you know, heavily evacuated, do have a look in the 1939 register for them quite far from home. So these are children who are now returning to London uh, from 1945. Not all went to homes, some went to schools. As you can see, it's two nurses in the background, three nurses in the background rather than a family setting. So I alluded to crime and here we have some of our children from our criminal records. Photographs tend to only exist for serious crimes, what would have been considered convicts. So you won't find a, a, an enormous amount of photography uh, to do with child uh, criminals, as it were, or children who broke the law. Uh, and you tend to find them after the 1870s. So obviously photography comes in in its earliest form in the 1840s and 1850s, but we really don't see it um, become a mass adopted thing until around the late 1860s and for sort of government purposes into the 1870s. And the two red dots are just the two children that I'm going to pick out. Uh, and I think Kate is up first. So Kate is 14 years old and four months old, and uh, she is described as having a fair complexion. She's four foot eight and a half. That half is always very important. So she's under five foot tall. She is considered stout and short. And another document actually describes her as fat. She has a round face. Uh, she disturbingly has scars on her chest from a scald, several scars about the body from being scalded. Um, but she does have vaccination marks on both arms um, and a cut mark on her first left finger. So scalding, obviously, and that also brings us to another point, you know, children catching fire because their bassinets are left by an open fireplace where a candle falls into their cot. Um, also, if anybody has any, you know, a good night, Mr. Tom, where they say he's sewn into his clothing. I've never actually come across an official reference to that. Um, and I'm always very interested if anybody has come across official references of children being sewn into their clothing. So these sorts of things can happen. You can imagine that if you are sewn into your clothing or indeed in her case, if she was doing any sort of domestic service, getting scalded, getting burnt was was quite a regular thing. The charges against um, Kate are an attempt of murder and larceny. So I think she was robbing somebody and it became a scuffle. And so the charges against her are attempted murder and larceny. And she receives 12 years uh, in prison. James Mackenzie is 14 years of age. Uh, I think that's crossed over 16 because, of course, the law was quite different if you were over the age of 16, treated as a man rather than as a juvenile. And assault and robbery, £10 notes, uh, two £5 notes and some other items. So theft was obviously a very serious crime. He's given five years. And uh, he's described as being four foot nine at the start and five foot three uh, at some point during this documentation. And he has a blue mark on his right forearm, so some form of tattoo, which would be described. And they have uh, some details of parents, of course, as well, because these people are juveniles. 
So juvenile crime is a huge topic. I covered off some of it in our crime webinar, which should be hosted, I think, on our YouTube. Ellie, correct me if I'm wrong. And, um, you know, we would invite you to look at the crime records as well. And again, the point of this being don't discount the possibility that they have a record of some description. And children can have records for non-attendance at school. Okay, so not only was the parent prosecuted, but the child was prosecuted. So just be aware of that as well, is that, you know, some of the crimes that you may see an ancestor being accused of or imprisoned for, you know, they're no longer crimes today. Five years. Of course, reformatories open in the 1850s, I believe it is, for the UK. And what we see is children imprisoned for two weeks before they head off to the reformatory for five years, or depending on what their sentence is. Generally speaking, about five year sentences there. And she can read, uh, he can read a little, but he cannot write. So education was also noted. And he's a Presbyterian dissenter. So the religion is also noted. Of course, the moral conduct of children, deeply important uh, during the course of the 19th century. And it uh, filters into everything, including play. This is a school at Deptford. I don't know why those captions are going off screen. In the 1920s. So it's a sort of a nursery school and they're playing some form of ring ring a rosy, it seems, at the top there. Although children have... Uh, dozens of variations of this and they vary up and down the country so what I would call ticky knock not even sure anybody here would understand that it's knocking on the door and running away uh, tipping off hats off people was a, a great pastime as well but this could also get you into a lot of trouble here we have some children on the street uh, they have an extremely fancy mechanical car and some uh, tricycles so uh, some extremely salubrious toys there. Certainly I have played uh, with the hoop of a bicycle in my time. And I think children make do with what they have. Here's a wonderfully disturbing picture of some dolls being made in 1894. Which I just thought was uh, marvellous for its bizarreness. Uh, all the dolls with their their heads off and uh, I think she's she's stuffing the doll so the doll is a soft body and then of course uh, porcelain or bakelite perhaps later uh, limbs so play for children was uh, difficult particularly in urban areas where you have uh, no space for them to play whatsoever. So they're up in front of the judge for playing pitch and toss, particularly on a Sunday, because they're technically they're gambling on a Sunday. And so you have the playground society that develops in the 1850s, and they are looking for playgrounds. Now, they're not necessarily play playgrounds as we conceive them with swings and slides and that sort of thing. They're literally playgrounds, a space that children can have access to in a city. Uh, in many cities, of course, the parks were actually private. They were associated with a square. They weren't very large, and so they were private for the residents only, and not everybody could use the parks. So you have this idea of a playground society for providing for the children to play. And then, as I said, many of my clothes were homemade. Um, I don't know if yours were homemade when you were a child. And of course, you've got plenty of hand-me-downs from the cousins. And uh, fashion for children changed over the years. Children are not miniature adults as such. It's simply clothing was clothing. Some concessions, of course, were made for children. Clothing tended to be shorter for both girls and boys. And they were slightly more practical, a bit more free-flowing, a little bit less restrictive uh, because they are children. And, um, you know, they can have accidents. And on that score, we can talk about boys breaching there is a story that goes around that, that boys were dressed as girls until they were, you know, whatever it was in, at the time in the society, three, five, seven years of age, depending on the time and place. You do actually see boys as old as 12 in what would be considered tunics or what they called coats. They were not dresses as such. They were simply a tunic shaped uh, garment and this idea that they were dressed as these so they wouldn't be stolen away by the fairies seems like nonsense to me because fairies are invariably depicted as women so why would be afraid of boys being stolen by the fairies 
But of course, if you think about it, and if any of you have young boys, it is eminently more sensible to dress them in some form of tunic or some loose fitting garment to allow for toilet training. And so traditionally they would receive their first pair of short trousers, uh, again, quite loose fitting, when they were about three or four years old, where presumably they can manage the bathroom by themselves. And then, but as late as 1969, we have an advertisement for your first pair of long trousers. Obviously the construction and the cost of long trousers is uh, more expensive. Children grow terribly fast. And so trousers, short trousers are more forgiving. Tunics are even more forgiving again. And uh, so the long trousers tend to come in um, and obviously fabrics have become much cheaper since then. Uh, they come in when the child is that bit older. And so I just wanted to touch on this idea that, uh, you know, teenage sort of comes about in 1930s and, and really post-war then you have this idea of teenagers being very different to children and adults and that it's a very distinct period in life but also post-war you have the ability to market to these if you're being beginning to be influenced by um, American wealth because of course Britain was still quite depressed after the second world war you know there was still rationing until 1952 I think it was but you begin to see a market open up and that actually dictates a lot of what you see becoming available for children. You know, can you sell something? But there was an understanding that adolescence, so if you search for adolescence rather than teenage, you get right back to the 1840s. This idea that there is a difference between the child, the child from the boy, the boy from the man and the adult from the old man, physically, mentally and all of that. In the space of two years from its birth, every infant has ceased to be an infant. So they're considered an infant until they're two, has become a child. And in the space of six years from this period, every male child will have become a boy. Add eight years to this time and every boy will have become a young man and then into an adult. So there is this idea of stages in life that are understood. So everybody has, as I said, a different childhood. Um, and when considering your ancestors' childhood, reflect on your own, reflect on your ancestors' socioeconomic position, geographically where they are. Are they in an urban setting? Are they in a rural setting? What's available to them? What year is it? Did they have education before it became compulsory? Was education simply not on the cards? Even when it became compulsory, many people simply had to keep their children out of school to help with the family business or indeed to work in the local factory. And this image, again, I think from the Illustrated London News, you have two what look like uh, shepherd boys and they're singing a song, I think it's Christmas time. And then you have the two slightly more wealthy young ladies uh, with the maid servant listening to their song at the door. So these are some of the books that I have in my collection. Um, some of them are only available secondhand at the moment. If you do have an interest in either the clothing of children, the psychological development of children, I can certainly recommend The Mind of the Child, 1840 to 1900, for the how children were perceived, uh, how they were considered closer to the savage, which was an 18th century concept of the innocence of man when he was... Uh, without the trappings of society and children before the age of seven were considered to be kind of this ideal of a natural child. And then probably the, the best, most general one is The Invention of Childhood by Hugh Cunningham, which specifically looks at a thousand years of British childhood. I don't know why I'm holding it up. You can't see me holding it up. And then Childhood Transformed, you will only get that one secondhand, but that speaks specifically to working class children in 19th century England. Some of the concepts in it might be a little outdated, but it's this idea of children's lives being centred around work to being centered around school as the 19th century progressed. And then yesterday's children is uh, just some antiques. And then the one that sort of covers off children's lore. So all of the things you may or may not be uh, familiar with, the sort of rhymes and not the games, but the sort of topical rhymes and stuff that children engage in uh, and the different variations across the country. Because as I say, we all speak a common language, but then it turns out we all call 
uh, different games by different names or our rhymes are slightly different to one another from our childhood. And that is it from me. Uh, that went slightly longer than expected. I do apologise, everybody. Um, I will look back at the comments and uh, engage in the conversation as best I can. Uh, I would invite you all to continue the conversation uh, in our Facebook group or indeed on the commentary here. And uh, I shall uh, see you all again. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Anya. I'm sure Ellie will let me know if there are any comments that I specifically need to answer. And if anybody wants a list of the books, we can get that uh, list typed up for you and pop it on to a comment or a description of the video. Hi Audrey, thank you so much. So kind of you to have watched. Thank you Pat, Georgia, and I'm sure you'll all be back to watch Ellie on Friday. Lovely, I might end the video there and let everybody get off home. Bye now. <laughs>